everybody. Thank you. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Tuesday. Not our normal day, but I appreciate not having to be here yesterday. <laughs> um, all right, moving on with the agenda. Can I get approval of the minutes of the meeting held on May 14th, please? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. All right, Bev, any persons wishing to address the board? Thank you. Can I get approval of the agenda, please? So move. Oh. I, I would like to address the board. Um, we have uh, procedures to sign in at the back by Bev there. Um, You know, if you just fill it out and then you can come in. Okay, thanks, Beth. Uh, I'm. Uh, I just need, that. just for the record, we need your name and your address, please, sir. Uh, Rick Eltoff, 2600 East 33rd Street. Um, I'd like to. My main uh, interest is to give you a little bit of a background, very briefly. I'm the father of ten living children, and all of them have gone through the public school system. And uh, one of the concerns that I've had over the years is the overall quality of the system. And at the same time, I know we're all very in tune to provide the best we possibly can. So that being stated, I simply want to remind you all that we have two thirds of the property taxes goes to the school system. And the getting into this thing of the past, uh, treasures of schools and so on is, is questionable. At least it should become a, a very open discussion for where we want to take the educational system. And in my understanding in all these years is that the mission of the school system is to provide a quality education to the students. Brick and mortar did not necessarily do that. The hearts of the teachers definitely do that. And as we all are somewhat aware, uh, the different restrictions that have occurred from the federal government on down have made it difficult to provide the creativity and the value to each and every one of those individual students. So there's gotta be an open discussion recognizing the amount of tax dollars that are being invested from this community to make sure we get the most positive outcome we possibly can. And again, I would suggest to you that an open discussion, even more so than the task forces presented, needs to be dealt with because most of those comes from the historical perspective of having schools in every neighborhood, if you will. That would be the preference. However, with technology being where it is and all these different enhancements and advancements of education, we need to be mindful of that. Uh, very simply, I had put in a call uh, back in April 19th and was referred to Deanne Conrad and left a voicemail and have never heard from her as at this point at all. And it's unfortunate because I understand she's the head of community relations. And it's absolutely essential to have a good viable re uh, re response among the citizenry. Can, can I interrupt you just for a moment? One of the things that I won't allow is to have individual employees of the school district uh, taken down in any way during public comment. If you have an issue with an individual, I expect that that will be addressed with that individual. If you have general comments that you wanna to bring to the board, I'll sit here and give you your five minutes. Well then I will take it from a general concept then. Uh, it's very, very important for the administration 
and everyone who's involved at the administration to respond appropriately to the community. Agreed. And I apologize if I brought up any particular, but I wanted to make sure you understood that this does occur. And it doesn't only occur in the school system. It occurs in the bureaucracy worldwide, or the United States wide even. And it's unfortunate. We need to go back to some of the basics of getting discipline in the classroom, expectations of, 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 of academic excellence, and make sure that they understand the value of that all the way along. And again, a questionable approach is, is, is building more brick and mortar, is that the appropriate thing? I don't know. It's open for discussion. Everybody's got a lot of different theories. However, we've gone through common core issues. We've gone through whole language issues. All these things over the years have generated some the theories that have not been proven to be enhancing the overall value of education. And uh, that's evidently all the uh, studies that have come up of recent and so on, international and so on, it's pretty clear that we rank in probably the bottom half of overall uh, value that we put out in their students, you know, as far as turning them out to be good constructive students. And it goes back to a number of issues, but things like civics perhaps should be revisited as far as putting into the overall agenda. Uh, many of our generation uh, have not, was not even aware that civics had been taken out of the overall value of, of, of uh, teaching capabilities and, and so on. So that being said, um, that's what I'm here to at least bring an awareness of that, recognizing that two thirds of the budget comes from, two thirds of the property taxes come from the, uh, you know, goes to the school system in that regard. And I'm very concerned about the overall quality as many other people are. And I know there's been many different objective ways to try to accomplish that. But it's very, very important that we stay apprised of that and stay focused on the mission of providing a quality education for students. So that being said, I thank you, and I thank you for allowing me to at least express that concern. Have you been on our website to look at the facility study information? Because it also listed three public meetings are open to anyone, and we're also going to send out a community survey. So we, I hope you would participate in the survey when it comes forward, um, because we, do, we are trying to get as much input as we can. Mm -hmm. um, and that website has a lot of information. So from what you're saying, I don't think you've been on that, so that you don't know what is going on. I'm sorry you haven't gotten the communication you want, but if you go to our school district website, we do have further information of how we are trying to get as much information and community input as possible for this. So thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, as an attestation, I did the come to one of the uh, meetings, but does not able to have an audience or speak at that point in time. And since then, I've had two children. My youngest has graduated from college as well as another child that graduated, and I was at other graduation events where I hired. But yes, thank you for bringing that to my attention, and I was aware of it, and at the same time, I strongly encourage public input and public uh, participation, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, moving on. Can I get an approval of the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Good news report. I see we've got Boyd Perkins here. Computer just went to sleep. <laughs> Well, good evening. My name is Boyd Perkins. I'm coordinator of fine arts here in the Sioux Falls schools. And I just thank you for allowing me to take five minutes of your time here and just brag a little bit about our students and our teachers and some really tremendous things that are happening. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about our visual arts program. That's a program here that is really outstanding in the Sioux Falls schools and flies under the radar of a lot of people. Um, of the accomplishments that are going on because they just aren't as public in what they do. But I wanna point out a few things that are going on in our visual arts program in the district. 
Um, I'll give you a brief art program overview. Every student in the Sioux Falls School District experiences fine arts education at some point in their schooling. In grades K through seven, they take fine arts, visual arts as part of their regular curriculum. Um, our elementary students get 70 minutes per week with a certified art teacher at every K through five. And then by the time they're in sixth and seventh grade in the middle school, they get one quarter per year that they're required to be in. And then in grades eight through 12, it becomes an elective that they can choose to take if they, if they so do that. I'm gonna focus a little bit on our high school programs right now because they've had some really tremendous public success that I, I just hope everyone uh, can be uh, aware of. And on the uh, screen, there are just a few select shots of some of the pieces that have come out uh, this year and been entered in some of our art shows. This happens to be photography right here and you can see the girl doing, uh, working with dust and you can see what she was able to come up with in terms of uh, a pretty stunning picture actually. Our high school offerings involve uh, exploring visual arts, which is an introductory course, drawing one and two, 3D design and construction, painting one and two, photography, which is very popular right now, graphic design, which is computerized, introduction to arts, audiovisual technology and communications, art independent study one and two, AP studio art and drawing, 2D and 3D design. This year, the Roosevelt High School Art Program won the state championship. That particular award was given out at the uh, boys championship ball game in the Premier Center. The, each year, the South Dakota Activities Association has in conjunction with the state basketball tournament, the state art show, in which case uh, entries from all over the state uh, bring entries in and put them up and they're juried by select jurors. This year, um, Sioux Falls Schools, there are 12 categories in fine arts, visual arts. Sioux Falls Schools got first place or champion in eight of the 12 categories. That means one of our students was first place in, from all four of our high schools in eight of those 12 categories. And we had top three finishers or medalists in all 12 categories. So there was not a single category where a Sioux Falls student was not brought up to receive a medal in that. It's really, I think, an outstanding accomplishment and says a lot about our students and the support they have and their teachers and what's going on. What you have right here is a 3D example. This was um, made by Mackenzie Brandt at Washington High School. It's actually on display out in the lobby right now. This got best in show and in class AA. We've also had some winners at the national level that are, are really impressive. I'm gonna just briefly go over some of those. Karina Provost is a sophomore at Roosevelt High School. She specializes in native art. She is a winner of the Oscar Howe Summer Art Institute Scholarship. She'll be off studying art with native artists, also some uh, USD faculty members this summer at uh, tuition free at the University of South Dakota. She placed in the state um, art show and she's also placed at some regional festivals. We have one of her artworks out here right now and they're really, they're really touching when you look at them and look close, up close to them. This is one, uh, Karis Webb won the Scholastic Art Award and that is an award that's actually brings together art and writing and she was, they take five art pieces from the state of South Dakota and they move them on to New York City where they are judged by a panel in New York City. Of those five from South Dakota, all five were from Roosevelt. And Karis Webb won that. The award ceremony is gonna be in Carnegie Hall and this piece is gonna be, that's June 6 through 8. This piece will be on display in New York City as well. Um, now here's another one that's really fascinating. This is a young lady by the name of Ashley Garretts. She finished first place in three categories in the state art festival. She is a junior. She has placed, she has won the congressional art competition for the state of South Dakota. She has, uh, in her freshman year, she got second place for the state of South Dakota. In her sophomore year, she got first place. And then this year, her junior year, she got first place again 
Her work will be on display in the um, Cannon Tunnel, which is a connecting tunnel between, it's where the congressional offices, it's mm -hmm. where they walk underneath the street to go to the Capitol building. It's lined with these winners of, of, these art, of these art galleries. You can see some of her works there. She's extremely prolific and she's also an extremely high aptitude student. She could do anything when she graduates. Mm -hmm. But her work is really stunning. The one with the ferret right there is the one that won this year. I don't have that one with me, but I do have these two out in the lobby on the right. The one in the middle is a self-portrait. You'll notice she did that. She did that on a piece of plywood with a pencil, and she not only just did it, it's actually a negative. So she's writing, if you think about a negative, the black and white are reversed. Mm -hmm. It's pretty fascinating to look what she did. You can spend some time looking at that. And the other one is painting. She's good at painting, she's good at watercolor, she's good at drawing, she's also good at colored pencil drawing. So it's just fun to watch her grow in there. This is a picture of the Cannon Tunnel um, that I just pulled off the web. I just wanted to point out some fantastic art opportunities and some accomplishments by our students that we have going on. It's our uh, teachers at Roosevelt are real good about getting that information out, so I have some of those uh, really uh, exemplary students that we have up there. Also this summer, to point out, down at the pavilion, we have the art teacher exhibit going on all summer. So you can go in and see some of the work by our art teachers. A high number of them are actually have their own art studios and do produce quite a bit of work. Mm -hmm. That's what I have. I just appreciate your time very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thanks for bringing the, well, I noticed them as I came in and just some really stunning pieces. So thanks for bringing them into our lobby. Yes, and the new tech, the ones on the wall are from, that's a permanent, not permanent, but that's been there for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. That's from New Tech. That is graphic design with computer and photography. They specialize in that at New Tech. Huge industry in graphic design right now. Mm -hmm. they, as you can see, the kids are getting a great experience out there with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I didn't see any conflicts of interest this oh, week. Or this, okay. Moving on to the approval of the consent agenda. Can I get a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, and moving on to supplemental consent agenda um, 9A, claims to Sanford. Can I get a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That passes with two abstentions, one from board member Ryder and one from board member Mickelson. All right, on to the reports of the superintendent. Okay, well, it's my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce to you Val Peters. Val probably needs no introduction at this point. <laughs> uh, but uh, she, will, she will speak to you tonight about a program that we work in conjunction with the United Way, the Sioux Empire United Way, and it's called Ready to Start. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> and to the rescue. You need special glasses to view your <laughs> You do. <laughs> we'll have Ben who will fix it though. I just want my screen to look just like what you will see. <laughs> so while he's working on that, thank you for have, letting me have the opportunity to be here tonight to visit with you. Um, I know you've all received what kind of ended up being kind of a lengthy board report there. So I've taken some key port parts of that. And if we can't get it to do that, then I'll just. I'll be able to follow there. And put those into a slide presentation to um, share with you a little bit more about Ready to Start. So it will be an update of the program, um, the review of the results from last year, our 2017 summer, as well as an update as to where we are for the 2018 summer. Ready to Start started out as a community impact grant in perfect things. So this, this will, um, I won't touch it. Um, in 2012. Um, at that time, um, Doug Morrison had found an article about a Ready to Start program in <coughs> California, and we did a little bit of research, um, and the United Way partnered with us in the Community Impact Grant to start the program here in Sioux Falls. So we started with um, 60 children, and we've grown now to 90 children, and we are a partner agency <coughs> grant with the United Way. So we currently have um, six classrooms that we'll have this summer and a total of 90 children in that program. So 
Um, we support the children that are on the Head Start waiting list and the title waiting list. And these are children who were on that waiting list waiting for their spot in our early childhood program. And because of space and the limitations of space and funding, they um, may not have gotten an opportunity to experience preschool before they now are going to enter kindergarten in that fall. Um, so for next fall, they'd be going to kindergarten. So we take a look at those children who are on that waiting list and we offer them the five week ready to start program for them. Like I said before, we've grown to 90 children and we're at three different elementary schools. So we currently have two classrooms at Laura B. Anderson, two at Hawthorne and two at Hayward. So we've kind of followed the summer climb program to where the locations are for ready to start as well. The design of Ready to Start is to um, target those little learners right before they enter kindergarten. So we get the, them the five weeks right before they're going to walk through those kindergarten doors. Um, they have not had an opportunity to participate in either the public or the private preschool opportunities. And we focus on 21 essential, essential skills um, that kindergarten teachers have said if kids could just have some experience in these 21 skills, we think they could be successful. So. They get a total of 80 total hours, um, four hours a day for 20 days. It's a structured, consistent daily routine. It looks very different than an early childhood daily routine. It's a little bit more teacher driven. We, um, you could ask any one of those teachers in those six classrooms, how many minutes did you spend working on counting today? How many minutes did you spend today working on letters, letter sounds, identifying letters? And they would be able to tell you it's that structured. And it's structured like that so that we can assure that we really focus on those 21 skills and monitor the progress of those children. There's one teacher and one education assistant in every classroom, and we have 15 kids in those classrooms. We do pre-tests the first week, and then the last week of the five-week session, we do post-tests. And we do that so that we can ensure that the program um, supports kids in making the progress that we wanna see, um, so they have that readiness to learn as they walk through the kindergarten doors. So the eligibility for the program, all of the children, all of those 90 kids that will be in that program this summer have to be children that will be going to kindergarten in the Sioux Falls School District. So they're from targeted families, so they're from families who are on that Head Start waiting list or the title waiting list. Um, if they got into early childhood, they would have had less than six months of early childhood. So if we had a little one who got into our program this February, we might look at them as also a potential ready to start student if we have space. Um, once we've gotten all of those children in the program whose parents want them to participate, then we go to our kindergarten registration list. So those kids who are at kindergarten registration or have registered for kindergarten at our title elementary buildings. And then we fill our slots with um, families who are interested in the program from that list. So we have ongoing identification and recruitment activities um, to find those little ones before Ready to Start begins. We talked about where those classrooms are and we also provide transportation to those classrooms. We encourage families to bring their children to and from ready to start. So that really helps not just kids get ready for the structure of kindergarten, but parents get ready for how that's gonna work for them. But if a child can't get to ready to start because of the transportation, we will provide transportation for them. We also provide a daily snack and because our sites are at a site where there's a free lunch program, we will have the children who are riding the bus go through the free lunch program and have lunch before they get on the bus to go back home. It becomes a really long morning for a little one if all you've had is a snack. Um, we do provide a parent education activity at each site before the end of the five week session. The focus of that is on kindergarten readiness skills, what we can do at home as parents to help support our children, and how to establish a routine at home to help your child really be ready for that first day of kindergarten. <coughs> We talked a little bit about the classroom teacher and the education assistant. We also have um, two program support staff. They do the pre and the post testing of the children for our um, assessment results, but they also support classroom teachers if there's a child who's having a struggle with following the daily routine or a behavior challenge, that support staff can go in and help that teacher um, figure out some strategies that will work for that child. And then we can pass those strategies on to the kindergarten teacher who will have that student um, in the fall. We also have a clerical that helps to support setting up transportation and making sure that if there's a child not received at the end of a daily session, someone is there to 
make sure someone picks them up. And then the um, oversight and management of the program is done by the early childhood coordinator. So the 21 essential skills that we focus on, you'll see those on your screen. These are the math skills from number sense to measurement and geometry to patterns and sorting. Language arts and reading, we work on concepts of print, phonemic awareness, alphabetic principles, and oral language. And then our supportive learning behaviors, these are the ability to follow directions within a classroom setting, oral participation, so being able to um, work on speaking in sentences to share the information that you have, being able to participate in conversations with your peers and the adults in the classroom, large motor skills, we want kids to be able to participate in activities in PE and gym, so we're working on some really basic skills there, as well as some small motor skills. So our, these are our results from the 2017 summer. Um, the average pretest score for our students last year was 63%, and the average post-test score overall for our students was 85%. So while last year we saw a little bit lower pretest score average for all of our students, the average percentage of gain, which you can see on your screens, um, is very similar to what we've had in our past year's results. So if you were to look at these results and then to look, go back and look at the results from every other year, you would see very similar lines of progress um, and percentages that our children have made. So in math, the average gain was 23%. In reading, it was an average gain for students of 22%. And in supportive behavior skills, an average gain of 15%. Of all of the children that participated in our program, um, they either all made progress, or for those students who pre-tested at 100%, they maintained their skills. Um, and I think we had a few of those. Um, we also, besides doing the pre and post testing, we also survey the kindergarten teachers of all of these students. So at the end of the first quarter, those kindergarten students will get a survey specific to the student that they had, or students that they had in the program. And they respond um, to some very basic questions um, about skills. It correlates with the elementary report card for kindergartners. And what we ask them are the students making progress, they is ideas is developing, and NI is needs improvement. And so you can see there the difference between the first quarter, and then we do that again at the end of the second quarter. So we follow them for the first semester of school. And what you'll see there is, um, in the area of language arts, we had 31 children who were um, proficient in language arts, and we had 49% the second, the second quarter, excuse me. And in is developing, we had 53% that first quarter, but it went down to 35% for that second quarter. Um, and as I watch those skills, what that tells me is that the children from the is developing, we're having more of them move that second quarter into proficient. So um, while what happens in the kindergarten classroom is really important, we also believe that they're getting sent to kindergarten with that readiness to learn that supports them in gaining those skills. You'll see the same kinds of trends in the math when you look at the math, proficient for first and second quarters and is developing and needs improvement our supportive learning beha behaviors, and this is consistent. It's usually, we see those big changes in first and second with math and language arts. We see changes in supportive learning behaviors, but we just don't typically see as great um, a percentage of change there. Just a few little um, pieces of information about some of the children in the program. There were 10 children that were identified by their kindergarten teachers as receiving ELL services. Um, three students received ELL services at the Elementary Immersion Center, so they started their kindergarten year at the Elementary Immersion, immersion Center. There are five children who participated in um, Literacy in Action. Three children by the end of the second quarter were then identified as needing special education services. And of all of those children, 100% of them made growth in that five weeks of ready to start. Um, of all of those 18 children, six demonstrated 30% or better in their growth. The largest overall student percentage of gain um, from pre to post test was 57%. It's a big jump for a little one. 
We also track attendance, um, attendance for our students. Um, we want to start working with parents during Ready to Start. If they're having problems with being able to get to school, we want to work through, the, through those issues with them. So we might do a home visit, um, have a conference with a family so that we can support them working and getting their child to school. We know that kids can be ready to learn, but in order to be ready to learn, they need to be present and in their seats. Um, we have for this coming summer, Ready to Start will be July 9th through August 9th. It'll be at the same three elementary schools. We will again serve 90 children. Um, the staff are currently hired and our training for staff is set at the end of June. So they'll be ready to roll out to their buildings at the beginning of July. Um, this program is fully funded by the Sioux Empire United Way. The funding for this summer has been secured and the funding for next summer 2019 has also been secured, so we're ready to roll with the same number of students um, and the same number of classrooms for both this summer and for next summer. Summer. So I would welcome any questions that you might have and for you to acknowledge the informational report, I'm ready to start. Thank you, Val. Okay. Any questions for Val? Are the teachers who apply for this type of a position typically kindergarten teachers, or what's we, the background of we them? We have a variety of them. Some are early childhood, some are kindergarten. Um, we have a second grade teacher. One year we had a middle school teacher who hmm. just loved it. Um, sure. So we do ask that they be a teacher. So, sure. so. Good. We are fairly lucky. We've had um, pretty consistent staff since we started the program, mm -hmm. um, which again helps your program stay and continue to grow strong. Mm -hmm. Has United Way expressed any interest in increasing? I see what our funds are for 19 and then 20 the application process started. Since we, our waiting list is increasing, would they ever up the amount that they're? Um, at this time, we've kept it at 90. Um, it's always surprising to me, while we can find the students to fill 90 slots, by the end of the summer, we have kids that will drop out. It's hard to keep all 90 kids there all summer and it's really important that we're using that money wisely and keeping those seats full so at a point if we get to a point where we have 90 children and we're able to keep them all summer long and keep all those seats filled then i think it would be appropriate to say what would be the next number we could serve the united way has been a great partner they're very supportive of services for young children um, and have been great to work with with this program any other questions can I get a motion and a second to approve the ready to start report? So moved. Second. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Any comments? Any further comments? I just want to say thank you, Val. Um, I think that the early, interven and early interventions we have available to our littlest kids are, I mean, we're just fantastic between summer climb and, and this program. Just we know what our waiting list is for Head Start and if we can take those kids and offer them this, it's just another opportunity we have to help them be successful in kindergarten. So, thank you. These are the kids that are probably most at risk of not being successful. And one of the one of the things that I guess as a longtime school board member and a person that's interested in education in the United States, we have a mandate to educate every child. And that to me is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. And um, it, uh, these are the kids that in other countries would not be receiving education. We find ways to educate them here. So thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Okay, thank you. Our next report comes from Child Nutrition Services, just when you think it'd be time to gear down the, the uh, nutrition program. Actually, we're getting ready to gear up for the summer. Here to deliver a report from you, for you is Joni Davis. Good evening, thanks for the opportunity to share that joy <laughs> of how we're gonna get up and running and ready to go on June 4th, this coming year. I appreciate the opportunity to give you an idea of what's going on with the Child Nutrition Services and our summer program, as well as our breakfast in the classroom for 2018-19. As you know, student success is, is tied very closely to the health and well-being of a child, and we take great pleasure in the fact that the Sioux Falls School District, district 
believe this, this so wholeheartedly and supports all those efforts. A key to a student's ability to focus in the classroom is really, is, is what's so vital. And we carry that through then into the summer months, realizing that if the school program should leave in terms of school lunch or school breakfast, we have something that we have in place that can help fill perhaps a void or a need that we know is there to assure that kids are going to be receiving what they need to have the best and most optimum experience in terms of nutrition. The Summer Food Service, as you know, has been with us and since the 1970s. We were one of the early participants in that program. The program itself does require that a site be have at least 50% of their student population as a free or reduced student, and then they're eligible to participate. So every year we're reviewing that list to see who and what sites we might be able to use and place the program. This year we're going to be having eight locations. Two of them will be new sites. We had ha have had them in the past, but revisited uh, these sites and want to pilot those for this year and see how that goes and those two new sites would be Garfield and Cleveland. We do have eight sites, as I mentioned, and uh, some of those will be serving breakfast and the majority will be doing lunch. We're so excited that we have the opportunity to work with other programs also to help with attendance. That's the one thing we want to have. If we have the programs, we want participation. And we're so excited that we've been able to work with Summer Climb, as mentioned earlier, ready to start the Multicultural Center, for example, in town, and or other groups that may come and use our sites because that is something that they are there for. The qualifier is that children be from the age of one through 18. There's no paperwork, they just come in and eat, and we're uh, overjoyed to be able to have them come and feed them. And that would be at each of the sites that are open as community sites. We'll be operating from June 4th to August 3rd, that'll be nine weeks this summer, that we will be having these uh, programs available at the sites. Uh, sites or other groups that can attend, as I mentioned, were certainly the area kids, we're looking for that. But certainly even daycare centers, daycare homes, uh, camps that might be taking place can utilize our sites also. And so that's where we're hoping that we've reached out and there's been a lot of great information out, not only on our own website, but through Feeding South Dakota and other places to encourage and let people know where all the sites are that families may wish to come uh, and, and join us for lunch. Last summer, for example, we served 6,009 breakfasts. And for lunches, we did 19,575. So we're hoping that we can continue that uh, and see if we can increase it. It's always the excitement, but that's a large number of meals, and we're very excited that we can do that. The sites that are gonna be participating this year that will be doing lunches will be Annie Sullivan, Terry Redlin, Food Service Center, our own center, Garfield and Cleveland, as I mentioned, and then we'll have three sites that'll be doing breakfast also, and that would be Hayward, Cawthorn, and LBA. Breakfast in the classroom, that's another thing that we've been involved in, and uh, so when Dr. Maher and Doug Morrison and the Midwest Dairy Council had a chance to sit down and we talked about that impact and how that might look here in Sioux Falls, we did go ahead with that program and offered that in the first year of 2016 to Terry Redlin Elementary. As we were making that decision where to have that opportunity for kids to actually have breakfast in the classroom after the day starts, uh, was based on them being a community eligibility provision school, which means that all the children in that building would have been eating free breakfast or lunch. And so combining that gave us the opportunity then to bring that new uh, mode to them to be serving breakfast in the classroom. In the next year, we did uh, Hawthorne and Lowell. And now this year, we're going to try something a little different in terms of a pilot, and we are going to try a school that is not a community eligibility provision school, and that will be Cleveland Elementary. Now, when you look at some numbers, for example, because we are taking, uh, watching those also, uh, we have seen an increase, and uh, basically a 90% increase in the participation of breakfast, and that's certainly the goal. That was the intent, to see if we could have more kids joining us for breakfast if it was brought into the classroom. And just to give you an example, Terry Redlin, when they started their first year, or the base year, pardon me, was 24,340 breakfasts. The next year with the breakfast in the classroom, we jumped to 56,381. With Hawthorne, they had um, 30,181 breakfasts, and with uh, last year's participation, they increased to 38,969. 
And with Lowell, they started with 35,828 and increased to 56,431. So we're finding that to meet the goal that was set in place as we looked at that. And with the breakfast in the classroom, we did receive grants for the Midwest Dairy Council, $5,000 for each uh, program when they started out to help cover the costs uh, and expenses attributed to getting those things going. The program itself for the summer food service program works on a budget, a federal budget. The intent is to try to supply and cover the cost that schools would need to operate the programs. And we have been able to just about do that. Uh, $71,000. $75 was the uh, operating cost last year, and when it was all said and done, we uh, had an ending balance of $4,492. If we go beyond that, that becomes a child nutrition services expense. Uh, you're only given so much reimbursement for the meals that you serve. The breakfast in the classroom, as I mentioned, the $5,000 grants at each site, but also with that, the only other real major increases have been some labor, of which uh, is attributed for more kids eating, so having those uh, individuals there to help uh, with the program and get things taken care of. And so when it was all said and done with the various costs and things, we did uh, have an increase of $58,320 to our breakfast program. And that uh, is very helpful. That's certainly based on participation that we're getting and those increases that we're seeing. The Sioux Falls School District has, these, as I mentioned, the eight sites that we'll be operating the summer program in. Um, the free meals, again, are from one through the age of 18. And so we encourage anyone to come. Parents can come. We do have an adult price that they could come and join uh, their children while they're eating there also. Three sites are Hawthorne, Terry Redland, and Laura B. Anderson for the uh, breakfast in the classroom program with Cleveland to be the addition for next year. And again, it being a pilot of a non-CEP school. I would certainly entertain any questions that you would have and otherwise request a recommendation of approval of this report for you. Thank you, Joni. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I think it's so important for kids to have something in their stomach in order to be able to learn. So we can bring food to them even better um, and help them prepare. I think that helps our teachers to be more effective because their students can focus on what they're at school to do and um, there's less distractions that way. So it's great to see it expanding and, um, and impacting more students and hopefully helping them to be more successful long-term. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the Child Nutrition Program update? I moved. Second. Any thank further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. That concludes our meeting. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.